So I've been involved in MECFS for about 30 years, first as an ME family, and then in the last 10 years, I've been studying the biological basis of the disease. Of course, during my time as a parent, I realized that ME is a very complex uh, disease with complex physiology, and I thought my normal way of studying human diseases, which are biomedical approach of a small sort of focused aspect, uh, wasn't going to actually kind of lead us to a great understanding. So I adopted uh, a more comprehensive molecular, a global approach to try and understand the global um, physiology dysfunctions in the disease. And by the end of the first year of the pandemic and the end of 2020, uh, we discovered some molecular signatures in immune cell proteins and also in the epigenetic code of the DNA of the immune cell, uh, which gave clear indications of, a, of a, a, a biological basis. And so about that time, I linked uh, with Anna because I saw that, you know, her expertise in immunology is a great complement to of what we're doing. So we hope that we can go forward and do some useful things uh, together. With the, of course, the pandemic, this gave new insights really into MECFS because here was a disease where everybody came down with the post viral fatigue syndrome about the same time. So they were, it was all synchronized. And so that was very helpful, I think, to give us some insights. And also when the vaccination campaign started, uh, we realized that MECFS people were very susceptible to adverse. Uh, severe adverse reactions, and that gave some further insight. So over the summer, I sat down to try and um, derive a model that could explain uh, the ongoing uh, disease profile of these post-viral fatigue uh, syndromes, and also the reason why there were so frequent relapses. And that's what I want to really kind of lead up to in my uh, talk today. So just to start off with, just to remind us a little bit about where ME CFS came from. Um, since 1930, there's been, when sort of publicity started, there's been about 75 reports of debilitating post-viral fatigue conditions after what are probably viral outbreaks. But these were very small outbreaks. They were geographically isolated and, you know, with maybe a few hundred people or the most a, a few thousand. And so they didn't receive great global attention or uh, interest or research investment. Uh, the name we have today came from two names. Firstly, ME came from the Royal Free Hospital outbreak in London in 1955 and CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome from the Ramada outbreak in Incline Village in 1984 on the shores of Lake Tahoe, Tahoe which is shown in the, in the picture. Of course, subsequently, we've learned that this condition uh, can develop not only from a viral illness, but from other causes, non-viral infectious agents, agricultural chemicals like organophosphates, from complex surgery, and just chronic severe stress. For example, I have a young woman in my University of Otago study group that suffered constant childhood abuse and developed ME as a result of that. And that generally makes up, it's felt about 20% of the cases uh, that we know today. So how does long COVID uh, compare to this? And hopefully what I'm gonna say about long COVID will complement what Anna has said. Firstly, of course, it's from a single infecting virus, SARS-CoV-2. So uh, this is like a pure example of an ME-CFS type illness. But the other big thing is that the pandemics now got up to 500 million infections worldwide. And that's given rise to long COVID, the post-viral fatigue illness, uh, which affects, depending on which paper you read from 10 to 50 percent. Now there's some very erudite papers that are claiming 50 percent, but let's say it's about 30 percent. But that would add 40 to 250 million uh, to the global burden of those um, with a post-viral fatigue condition. 
and globally MECFS is thought to be about 20 million. So this will be dominating. But in New Zealand, of course, because we uh, didn't have very many cases initially, and there's still uncertainty about how much long COVID Omicron will produce, we at the moment, of course, got many more uh, uh, MECFS cases than we do long COVID, but the long COVID obviously is growing. So I just want to emphasize again that MECFS really has come from boutique viral infections of just a few hundred or a few thousand and other stresses, whereas long COVID's from this one single virus, but huge numbers of infections. In uh, October 2021, the World Health Organization came out with a clinical case definition for long COVID. This was very useful for clinicians and researchers. It was interesting they did it with an iterative process where about 250 people, including patients and experts, and a and slight um, majority of women, given that there are more women affected with long COVID than men, um, went into this process. And the, the symptoms that filtered out that were most predominant were remarkably similar to those that are now accepted for MECFS. Now, this may have filtered out other subgroups like people with long COVID as a result of uh, damage to their hearts or lungs or kidneys or, or brain, or maybe those people also have a uh, uh, fatigue illness as well. Interestingly enough, the World Health, uh, World Health Organization gave a new name to it, post-COVID-19 condition. And this reminded me of what happened with MECFS in 2015 with the what is now the Academy of Medicine of the uh, US Academy of Sciences um, expert committee where they uh, suggested a, a replacement name for ME which was systemic exercise and tolerance uh, syndrome or disease. That's been given a, a marked thumbs down from the patient group and I suspect this new name uh, from the World Health, Health Organization for long COVID won't actually uh, be taken up very strongly. But here's the clinical case definition here. Fatigue, post-exertional malaise, brain fog, cognitive dysfunction, unrefreshing sleep pain were the major symptoms that were um, designated. The one difference between the two was that uh, whereas the diagnosis for MECFS is not made until six months, uh, for long COVID, three months was given as the critical cutoff point. So I've done a preliminary uh, pilot study comparing long COVID patients and MECFS just to see uh, how closely related these illnesses are. And so my evidence so far, I've got one arm of the big study has, has we've got data from. It suggests the, that uh, the two illnesses have very similar molecular signatures for their proteins in, in their immune cells. And I'll show, them a show you a little bit of data on that. Uh, long COVID seems to have a stronger inflammatory signal, but that may be because the cases are more recent. For example, all of the people that recruited were about a year into their long COVID, whereas the MECFS age gender match ones that I recruited from throughout New Zealand with uh, Dr. Ros Belling's help, um, they averaged 10 years. And so there may be a difference because of that. But clearly both conditions have a heightened immunological inflammatory response in the affected people. So they're very similar in that sense. So that made me think, can a disease model affecting the brain and the uh, central nervous system and causing dysfunctional brain controlled homeostasis and altered body physiology explain both illnesses? And, and, and I'll go on to talk a little bit more about that. So here's the data we've got from our comparative MECFS long COVID patient. Now I know this is a bit complex, but hopefully you're not colorblind and you can see the colors. Uh, what I want you to look at on the left-hand panel is there's red colors and those are the long COVIDs. Uh, orange are the ME and controls are the blue. And I think even just looking at that complex one, you can sort of see there's some separation of the blues from the red and oranges. What we're looking at there, if we can look at something uh, like one of them here, 
S1, what we do is we do this by mass spectrometry and we put the sample through four times just to make sure that the output data, and this is looking at 4,000 immune proteins, all of the data set is crunched up as one point. We look to see whether if we put through it again, does it give the same pattern? You can see the four for S1 are all very closely uh, on this principal component analysis. And here's S5, they're all together. So we know technically the outputs we're getting reflect what's in the, in the sample. So what I've done in the right-hand uh, picture here is to combine long COVID and ME and leave the controls there. And what you can see is that the long COVID ME actually are in a different space of the principal component three above the dotted line and the controls are all below. And just as we had with our original ME study, two of the patients actually look like healthy controls. They may have been misdiagnosed, we don't know. We had nine of the 11 of our patients in our original study clustered in two uh, look like control. So those have been excluded from the data. So this is an amazing result that when we just pull all of the data from all of the proteins that we can measure in the immune cell, we separate out uh, long COVID from the controls for a start, but we actually have overlapping the ME CFS patients and the long COVIDs um, uh, and they are separated from the controls as well. So that makes me call that these diseases, diseases are sister diseases. As I say, one comes from just a single virus, MECFS, from multiple ways. So the hypothesis for the model then is that these two post-viral fatigue illnesses are sister illnesses, um, that they are actually the body's response to the individual stressor, to a perceived danger, rather than the characteristics of one stressor or another. So when we talk about these post-viral fatigue illnesses, whether it be ME or long COVID, and as I'll say in a minute, a, a post-vaccine uh, response, they're really the body responding to a, an extreme stressor, at least as perceived by that individual. Now, only a fraction of the population react in this way because we think they have a genetic susceptibility. And I'll talk about uh, that a bit later. So, you know, when I, when my daughter was ill initially with the illness, I wondered, for example, why did she get the illness and not her sister, for example? And, and so we want to kind of um, reflect on that a, a bit of, in, in the ongoing research. So we've said MECFS reflective of multiple initiating stresses. So we've got these environmental stresses. If they are prolonged, we get what's called a cell danger response. We think that's brain focused and that leads to the chronic illness. If this resolves quickly, then the chronic illness doesn't actually develop. Now, there may be unique features depending on the initiating agent and uh, Anna's talked a little bit about COVID-19 and long COVID and so in, in, in the hypercoagulation aspect of the long COVID, which we don't know is in MECFS. So there may be some unique features, but there's a lot of commonalities. And we're saying if that perceived danger of uh, signaling does not dissipate, then the diseases uh, sustain long-term, constantly fueled by life's typical stresses. And I'll show some details of the model right at the end. So there are certainly benefits from studying the two diseases together, given that already I've shown that the physiological response is very similar in terms of the immune inflammatory response and some of the other uh, energy uh, production in, in the uh, immune cells. Sadly, so far, much of the research being published uh, around long COVID and, and COVID doesn't utilize the knowledge and experience of MECFS as a model for long COVID, but I hope that will change and, uh, and the two will be looked at sort of uh, together. Of course, in the last five years, we've uh, now have some understanding of the biological basis of MECFS 
what causes it to be a lifelong disease and why there are frequent relapses. And of course, I'm going to go and talk more about that. So we've got something to offer, I think, for long COVID research. But with the boutique nature and the geographically isolated nature of ME-CFS outbreaks, there's been little investment in ME-CFS research over many years. But now with the new intense interest in long COVID and, and promise funding, uh, this has potential to benefit ME-CFS as well as long COVID, and I hope that will happen. And just to finish on a more positive note, the good thing is that we don't think MECFS and, and also long COVID are neurodegenerative conditions. In other words, we don't think this is permanent degeneration in the brain and the CNS. And so while it's extremely debilitating, there seems to me anyway to be hope of finding a way to reverse the illness in both cases. If we can find the key to switching from this danger signaling response uh, to a healing response. Now, I just want to say a little about the post vaccine adverse reactions that have um, uh, you know, been showing up not only internationally, but also definitely in New Zealand. And I've had you know, over 100 patients contact me just uh, randomly um, in the last four months to talk to me about their adverse reactions. Um, so we should remember that some people have ME-CFS uh, because of a result from a vaccination, might have been a flu vaccination or whatever, and several people have contacted me in the last four months who have had ME-CFS from an initial vaccination, and of course were very vaccine hesitant about actually taking uh, the Pfizer vaccine. But what the Anzamese survey, which, you know, congratulate Fiona for initiating this um, showed was that one, at least I'm looking at what I uh, got by the end of last year, one in four MECFS patients, hugely uh, high incidence have experienced severe ongoing deterioration of their ME following vaccination with Pfizer vaccine. And that coincides with all of the phone calls and emails I've had from individual patients that have just contacted me to tell me their personal histories. Now there are increasing reports in healthy people um, of developing a long COVID MEC of CFS like fatigue condition following vaccination. The last couple of weeks I've had contact from a cardiologist in Auckland and uh, a, a doctor at Minimal Hospital who said they're now seeing patients who were healthy before vaccination and coming in with fatigue and, 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 and with brain fog and whatever. In other words, they look as though they've got exactly the same symptoms as we have with ME-CFS and with long COVID. So what this is seemingly saying is the vaccine is an internal stressor in some people uh, 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 that can invoke the cell danger response and lead to a metabolic uh, shutdown and the symptoms are very similar to the uh, post-viral illnesses. So we can ask, well, who is susceptible to these reactions to stress events like the virus infections, uh, like the vaccination or the other stresses? Well, we know in MECFS, if we take Epstein-Barr that Sarah mentioned, um, quite a high proportion of people with MECFS, you know, it comes from the Epstein-Barr Epstein-Barr glandular fever virus, there's been an estimate of one in 10 people actually develop ME-CFS after Epstein-Barr. I think that's probably a little bit high. So I've put on, on this slide 10 to one in 10 to 50, still a significant incidence. With long COVID, of course, if we take the middle point, about one in three people after COVID infection developing long COVID, certainly with the earlier variants, we don't know about Omicron. So this looks like those variants invoked a much stronger immune response in the susceptible people than perhaps um, the Epstein-Barr virus might have, or pre-infection with Epstein-Barr, as I think Anna mentioned, might have actually been a factor in them developing uh, long COVID. With vaccination, I'm estimating just from what I'm hearing now from healthy people and from these clinicians, 
there might be an incidence of one in a hundred thousand or even you know a higher incident between one and you know maybe twenty thousand or a hundred thousand of healthy people getting a post um, vaccination effect which is ongoing uh, and with MECFS of course because they're already a pre-selected susceptible group to responding to a stressor where their immune inflammatory system responds to stressor uh, uh, in this this way um, you know we always knew that there was a theoretical risk that they could have a higher instance but you know, I was horrified when I saw how high this was. Turns out there's very little work being done on who is susceptible. And, and I think Sarah mentioned this too, that determining uh, susceptibility for people who um, come, who will after an event come down with these illness, uh, we have little knowledge. If we knew what the susceptibility factors were by those who are at risk, you know, perhaps we could prevent some of the ongoing uh, fatigue illness by early clinical interventions. And so I'm hoping that if we can find this out, it could be taught in medical schools. So all clinicians through the country kind of were alerted to the fact that if they had people with these kind of factors and they had an ongoing and they had a severe viral infection or a severe stress event in their life, then, you know, prophylactic measures could be taken. So as a first step in this, we started a quantitative survey of family and personal histories of 100 MECFS patients, and we were hoping for 100 long COVID. At the moment, we've got about 50 to identify genetic and environmental risk factors that might actually be predisposing to the illness. And this has been done by a master's student, Anna Blair, who's actually a genetic counselling student masters uh, in the master's program at the University of uh, uh, Sydney Technology, and um, they've contracted the project to me so she can do it on a New Zealand patient. She's actually based in Dunedin. So what is the difference then between a susceptible and a non-susceptible person for developing these illnesses? Well, recoverers seem to have a healing response after a uh, initial period and the susceptible just have an ongoing cell danger response. So the recoverers, that's about 50% of the people, will suffer a stressful event. They will resolve it with a transient immune inflammatory response and maybe within a couple of weeks uh, that subsides and healing uh, uh, kicks in. Uh, but this isn't black and white. There are a number of people who take longer time to recover, you know, maybe up one, two, three months. And so there is, a, I think, a continuum of um, the responses of people's individual immune uh, systems to be able to cope with and recover from uh, that stressor. But of course, if it hits the time deadline, three months for long COVID and six months for MECFS, they deem to have an ongoing uh, illness and of course uh, you know pleased to hear from Sarah that children were actually recovering at quite a high frequency but for the adult group of course you know the estimate is that most people go on and have this for life unfortunately. So for the susceptible group um, we're saying that they have the immune inflammatory response there are features that signal to the body of, of ongoing danger and that cell danger response uh, kicks in and stays and that is important for sustaining the illness. So I've proposed a model now for understand, trying to understand the long-term nature of these body responses uh, to the initiators of whether it be MECFS uh, to uh, uh, long COVID uh, and also to the vaccine. And key elements of this is the brain and the central nervous system and the peripheral body systems are separate body compartments. So the brain and, and central nervous system is, is, is kind of, they've got a big wall around them. So uh, essentially they can't be transferred easily of molecules between 
the peripheral system in, in, in that brain compartment, and it's protected. And the consequence of that is they each have their own unique, separate immune inflammatory systems. So the key question in developing model is how do they communicate these two, the peripheral system and brain CNF communicate in MECFS and long COVID and post vaccination to sustain uh, the illnesses. So this is the model. And I know this is a very complex slide and so is the next one, but I'd, I'd like to just take you through this one because if we read from top to bottom, I think maybe you'll be able to sort of understand it. And then I'll just highlight some things that we've teased out that are going to be important in the model. So the initial event here is the stress event. It can be the um, SARS virus or it could be Epstein-Barr. It might be surgery in the case of MECFS or a major stress event or another microorganism or the toxic chemical. What that leads to then is a peripheral immune uh, inflammatory response. And then there's communication to the brain and the central nervous system. And uh, particularly part of the hypothalamus is a, core, uh, a, a, a small cluster of neurons in the hypothalamus called the paraventricular nucleus, which is the stress response of the body. And I'll come up with that. And that can, if this, signal is communicated, this can lead to fluctuating neuroinflammation. So that's in one direction, getting to the uh, brain, and then we develop our long-term symptoms. But that the brain then communicates back to the peripheral system, uh, and that's what, and this cycle keeps cycling around, and this is what we think sustains the illness. So, um, but in the communication from the brain, from the hypothalamus and the brainstem, we think mainly, there's what results is, is it some false signal. So we have a disturbed homeostasis, that means blood pressure, means glucose uh, control, that means temperature control. We have a, 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 an activated hypothalamus uh, pituitary adrenal axis with inappropriate signaling from there which uh, again signals back inappropriately to the peripheral system. And in addition to this, because the, we think this fluctuating neuroinflammation um, uh, causes the, this stress center to act um, in a dysfunctional way, when we just get normal life stresses, like you know your child leaves their lunch at home and so you, oh, I've got to do something about this, or someone leaves the door open and there's a cold draft. That kind of normal life stresses that most healthy people just take in their stride and their process in the brain. In the case of people with the chronic illnesses, these life stresses became much more um, predominant and uh, we get uh, fluctuations in the neuroinflammation. So the thing I want to just highlight is that we've identified three areas where we can have this communication from peripheral uh, system to the brain. One is called the inflammatory reflex, which is a where there's neurons which are sensitive to changes in molecules in the peripheral system, and they can communicate that to the to the those neurons can communicate that to the brain signal to the brain. There's the blood-brain barrier, which is a barrier which stops molecules getting from the peripheral system in our blood and things into the brain. That's normally a very tight sort of barrier, but the permeability of that can actually um, be disturbed. And we think that's an area where essentially might be important in, um, in this transfer. And then there's a and called the gateway reflex. And this is a weak points, if you like, in the system. And it's been shown that in, at some blood vessels, you can get actually leakage from the peripheral system into the brain. So these are important things in the model. And then the model over here and signaling back is the disturbed homeostasis, activation of the HPA axis in an inappropriate way. So the stress is not managed particularly well. So 
these are mechanisms which we think actually mediate these things. Now, I'm not going to try and talk you through this diagram. Uh, there's a, a lot more, a few more things on it, but I'd just like to highlight one or two things. And what one was uh, referred to by Anna, and that is that one way you can get the blood brain barrier permeability to be um, affected is by reactivating virus in the endothelial cells. And that we know that can occur with Epstein-Barr virus. Interestingly enough, when my daughter was in hospital during her acute phase several times, um, it, uh, I asked them to check whether, in fact, the, um, they could do Epstein-Barr uh, uh, virus antigens in the blood. And each time she was in there, you could see evidence of viral reactivation because the viral antigens in the blood went up uh, uh, enormously. We think the brain's immune system then becomes chronically activated uh, with this model. That's where the, we have constant neuroinflammation and the, the stress control center is damaged. Now, one of the things the stress control center does is to send out a hormone, it's called the corticotrophin releasing hormone, which actually goes to other neurons that produce serotonin. And so we get serotonin produced. Now, most of us think of serotonin as a good thing to have good levels because it prevents depression, but excessive serotonin out of control can actually lead very much to MECS uh, symptoms. And serotonin can feed back and loosen the permeability of the brain, uh, uh, blood brain barrier. So we think this is a, a key element of the mechanism that might be sustaining. Um, uh, the disturbed brain function and the chronic illnesses. And then the last thing I just want to refer to is we produced with the activated immune system reactive oxygen species called generally called oxidative stress, and that can lead to damaged mitochondria. These are the energy producing bodies in the brain and they get damaged so that it leaks out the energy molecule, which is called uh, you know, brief ATP, and that is the precursor to a signaling molecule, which we think might be the danger signaling molecule that's sustaining everything. So that, in a nutshell, is the model and the mechanisms which sustain it. And this is um, being uh, submitted to Frontiers in Neurology, and uh, we're just going through the final stages of that now. It's been built well reviewed by three international reviewers, and so I'm really hopeful that it will be accepted very soon into the international literature. So, how can we test this model, and what are therapeutic possibilities? Well, one of the things I think we, you know, that struck me in developing this is we need more longitudinal studies where we from an initial infection, like an Epstein-Barr, if we could have a cohort who get glandular fever and we could follow them, take blood samples at regular intervals. So if they then go on to develop ME, we would have be able to follow them through the whole course of the illness to confirm whether some of these events are occurring. We need more non-invasive brain, brain imaging uh, uh, becoming routine that is PET scan, so we can track neural inflammation. So an ME CFS patient, you know, could go and get regular brain scans uh, to check just, you know, how this is affecting the illness. Because at the moment we we've got some research information which suggests, which suggests neural inflammation is there, imaging data, but it's all it's single point stuff. It's not a longitudinal study. And one thing I thought I'd never um, be advocating was cerebral spinal fluid sampling. Uh, but in multiple sclerosis, they've done this to follow the various stages of the illness and the progression. And they claim this has been extremely helpful. So here you're looking at biomarkers in the cerebral spinal fluid to um, just give you an indication of how the, uh, the illness is proceeding. There is one part of the connection between the peripheral system and the, um, the brain, the inflammatory reflex that could be targeted therapeutically by, by specific anti-inflammatory agents. So, you know, 
one would hope that therapeutic possibilities could develop as we uh, we more into this. So I'd like to, as Anna did, thank uh, you know many people that have contributed to my research over over the time, and I really am very grateful to Anzames for the financial support and just general support they've given me and and in doing this research and like Anna it's been um, over, over the period of time it's been very difficult to get funding from mainstream research agencies and I've depended very much on generous private donations from individuals and families otherwise we couldn't have done this work so thanks very much